Good morning, uh, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Anne Mettler, and I'm the head of the European Political Strategy Center, which is the European Commission's in-house uh, think tank. And as part of my duties, I have the great uh, honor of serving as the chair of the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, ESPAS. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, this is a truly uh, unique collaboration between the Commission, the European Parliament, the Council of the EU, and uh, the European External Action Service, also uh, with the Committee of the Regions, the European Economic and Social Committee, and the European Investment Bank. And our work uh, focuses on global trends and strategic foresight. And as chair of ESPAS, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 ESPAS Annual Conference, Global Trends to 2030, Shaping the Future in a Fast-Changing World. Uh, before I move on, uh, there are two important pieces of information. One is on the uh, Wi-Fi access, uh, which you will see here. And I also want to ask you to please reply to Anna rosling Ronlund. She'll be presenting later today. She has 13 brief fact questions uh, that she's asking us. So please answer these by 11 o'clock today. And the direct link where you can do this is, um, is uh, listed here, uh, www.menti.com C094D4BA. So uh, I know it's not exactly easy, which is why I spelled it out. Uh, but please uh, do take a part. Uh, I promise you it'll be worth it. So um, I want to, first of all, very much uh, thank all the speakers uh, who are uh, with us uh, and who traveled uh, to Brussels from all corners of the world, some coming as far away uh, as uh, Ottawa, Accra, San Francisco, or Singapore. And of course, I also want to uh, warmly welcome all the participants, um, many of whom also came from very far away, um, and uh, choosing, of course, to spend the next two days with us. Um, I, of course, also want to acknowledge the presence uh, of so many colleagues from the ESPAS uh, network, and even though I don't believe, uh, yes, he is here, of course, uh, the honorary president of ESPAS, uh, James Ellis, uh, without whom we wouldn't be here uh, today, and also want to warmly welcome all the members of the ESPAS Young Talent Network. Um, and uh, let me just say about ESPAS that the last few years have really been an extraordinary a journey for us, and uh, today we are hosting the fourth edition of the ESPAS annual conferences and the last conference uh, in the cycle that we inaugurated in 2015, drawing insights from the first ESPAS report, Global Trends to 2030, Can the EU Meet the Challenges Ahead? And it is now almost time to turn the page and to start writing a new ESPAS chapter. As many of you may be aware, there will be elections for the European Parliament in May of 2019, and this will then eventually lead to a new institutional cycle across the European Union um, by the end of next year. But in this context, I want to make two announcements. Firstly, ESPAS will certainly continue beyond 2019, and I think that all institutional partners are absolutely committed to this unique project, and we believe that this inter-institutional collaboration around global trends and around strategic foresight is very unique, and it must be continued uh, today more than ever. So uh, what I can signal is certainly change, but also continuity, ESPAS will continue. The second thing I, I want, to, want to highlight this morning is that um, we'll be uh, writing and publishing a new ESPAS Global Trends Report to 2030, which will be published in March 2019. And uh, if you allow me, is Florence with us already? No, okay, so, but it will be written, the report, by uh, Dr. Florence Gaub. She's deputy director at the European Union Institute for Security Studies. Uh, she's already uh, started the report. Um, 
a first draft is already very promising, uh, but these two days will be very, very uh, important for the writing of the report. So even though Florence isn't here yet, she will be with us for the two days. She'll be listening very carefully uh, to the discussions um, and what will be said, and it will certainly feed into the report that we'll be publishing in uh, March 2019. So indeed, the main goal of the 2018 ESPAS annual conference is firstly to focus on the major social, economic, technological, and geopolitical trends that will shape Europe and the world uh, over the coming decade. And secondly, as I just said, to generate really new insights, uh, fresh ideas for the ESPAS Global Trends Report that we'll publish next year. So in terms of the proceedings for the two days, today we will mostly look uh, into the future of uh, democracy and governance, uh, sort of zooming out uh, to the global landscape to understand which trends and which drivers of change are shaping democracy and governance, as well as zooming in into the specific issues to grasp the emerging trends or weak signals that will determine either our global engagement or the fabric of our societies. And in addition, we should reflect on how to move from anticipatory governance to what we like to call anticipatory democracy, making our democratic institutions, governments, and societies uh, really much better at anticipating change and also becoming, therefore, more resilient. Uh, tomorrow the conference takes place, um, as, uh, as always, at the European Parliament, uh, but not in the usual premises. Um, uh, it's tomorrow in the Josef Antal building, so please pay attention to that, because in your documentation it says that uh, it takes place in the library of the European Parliament, um, so, but uh, there will, it will be in a new venue, which I understand is very, very nice, so we're looking forward to that. And tomorrow the day will be dedicated to future of economic society and global power. But I'm sure you'll hear more about that from Klaus Welle in a moment. Uh, so to a certain extent, during these two days, we want to create really a safe space um, for a very rich uh, brainstorming on all these trends, drivers of change, uh, actors, and emerging issues. And I stress safe space. Um, I really want everyone to speak very freely. Uh, this is an opportunity to really reflect on the future and, uh, and not uh, self-censor and, and, and really share with us what you, what you see coming. So finally, I'm also happy to announce uh, that we are launching a new publication, which you will find in your bags. I didn't bring it with me, but it's a wonderful compilation of essays uh, that were contributed by uh, the speakers, um, by many of our speakers. I want to warmly thank all of those that have contributed. It's a terrific publication, and I really encourage you to uh, read it very carefully. And um, um, so, as I said, tomorrow we'll continue in the parliament, and this is actually then the perfect segue to my dear colleague and good friend, uh, Klaus Welle, the uh, Secretary General of the European uh, Parliament. Um, I want to say about Klaus that um, he has been um, instrumental in making ESPAS of what it is today. Um, it's really, um, apart from obviously uh, being a very important uh, person in the European Parliament, a very important person across the institutions and really pulling this together and, uh, and uh, forcing us and really compelling us to anticipate the future better, to be better prepared, and is really an extraordinary thought leader that I have uh, learned very much from, and I look forward to what he has to say to us now. Please let me, uh, uh, please let's welcome Klaus Welle to the stage. Uh, thanks a lot, Anne, for the very friendly uh, welcome. We are discussing today the future of democracy and governance. And I think it's important when we think about democracy that we clearly differentiate between the different systems that exist because that will make all the difference. When you have a look at scientific literature, you see that the basic differentiation that's being made is between fusion of power systems and balance of power systems. Fusion of power systems are systems where the parliamentary majority and the government majority 
are the same. This is basically the system we have in our national member states. So you have a government who is carried by a parliamentary majority. The moment that parliamentary majority is no longer carrying that government, the government has to resign, there are new elections and so on. This leads to a very specific relationship between parliament and government and therefore for, to a very specific kind of democracy. In the European Union, our system is different. We are like the United States, a balance of power system. We are not a fusion of power system. We are a balance of power system like the United States, where the House, the Senate and the administration are all independent actors working together. But it's not that because the administration is suggesting something that Parliament is automatically supporting. In the European Union, we equally have a balance of power system, which means we have the Parliament, the Council of Ministers, and the Commission. And when the Commission is making a proposal, the point of view of Parliament is not, cannot be prejudged. It can be accepted, it can be rejected. Normally, it's being amended. So if you're in a balance of power system and not in a fusion of power system, in order to strengthen democracy, Democratic actors need independent expertise. If you're a member of the Bundestag, you're working 60% on documents that are provided by the government. Our job is not the same job. We have to develop an independent view on whether the Commission proposal is good, bad, or normally mixed. That means that if we want to strengthen democracy, we have to strengthen independent expertise. This forum is a possibility to strengthen independent expertise. We've built up over the first, last four years our independent research service with 160 analysts that's helping us to have independent expertise. We've increased the power in committee secretariats, the staffing levels by 50%, which is helping us to get independent expertise. So if we put this into the wider framework, how can you strengthen democracy and how did European democracy develop? I think we can basically differentiate between four phases. The first one I would like to call quantitative democratization. These were the early days of the European Union where Parliament was involved in more and more issues but basically had no decision-making power. Quantitative democratization. The second phase could be described as qualitative democratization. We had a role in more and more issues, and finally, we had decision-making power. That's the case with the ordinary legislative procedure, where we are now equal lawmaker with the Council of Ministers, but also in international agreements, especially trade agreements, where Parliament has the last say. That's what I would like to call quantitative democratization. The question is, where do we go from here? I would like to offer two ideas. The first is that Parliament traditionally has been confined to amending legislation. But if you're confined to amending legislation, then 80% of the decisions are already taken. 80% of the decisions are already taken, for example, by deciding what is the agenda. What should be on your plate? If you have no say in what should be on your plate, your democratic rights are automatically very much restricted. So Parliament should have an interest and has an interest to not be confined just to amending legislation, but to play a role throughout the whole legislative process, from agenda setting to consultation to legislation and scrutiny. That's, why, that's how we have changed the working of parliamentary administration and parliament over the last 10 years. And maybe the most outstanding example is the 10-point Juncker plan where Jean-Claude Juncker came out of the election campaign and asked for the 
election by the European Parliament, and of course his own group was rather inclined to do so, but why should other groups have supported him? And that's exactly how we get to content. The socialist group was, for example, asking for an ambitious investment program which turned into the Juncker investment plan. The Green Group was asking for a much more ambitious approach on climate change. And all these conversations and all these agreements finally have led to the 10-point Juncker plan, which was approved in the morning, and then Jean-Claude Juncker was elected as president of the European Commission by the European Parliament. So we are not only electing the president of the Commission, Parliament has also secured a major possibility in a gender setting, and in fact the 10-point Juncker plan has been rolling out over the last four years with a lot of success and parliamentary support. So this can be called democratization in time. So as a German, I have to be inspired by Einstein. And when you are inspired by Einstein, you cannot just speak about time, you also have to speak about space. Because we know since Einstein that we always have to think of time and space. The European Union is not a federal state, but it's a federal union. And that's why we have to use the F word again. The European Union is a federal union, and only if we know that we are federal union we know that we cannot decide everything in Brussels. We are just one part of a system of multi-level governance and we share responsibilities between the European level, the national level, the regional level, the local level, and we are nothing without the support of our citizens. That's why we have to understand that we are a federal union with a clear division of responsibilities. And if you look at how European legislation is in fact enacted, 99% is not being done in Brussels. 99% is done by the member states, by the regions, and needs the active support. But it's also true the other way around. The two major crises the European Union has been suffering from in the last 10 years, the financial crisis, and the crisis of uncontrolled immigration didn't start in Brussels. They started on the national level by governments who have not properly introduced and implemented European rules and regulations, who have not secured the necessary administrative capacity, and the overall European Union system has been infected basically starting from the feeds. So what we have to do if we want an efficient European Union, which is a federal union, is to systematically link the levels of that system, the European level, the national level, the regional level, the local level, and the citizens. And not just in one direction, in both directions. Not in the sense of top-down, but as a sense of a learning process where the European level is systematically linked into a feedback system that allows us to learn from our failures and mistakes and the feedback we get from our citizens. As Anes already said, we are very close to the next European elections. Last time was very successful for the European Union because we did innovate through lead candidates, which allowed and secured that no longer a person can become a commission president who didn't have an intensive dialogue with citizens first and try to start and understand what are the worries that are leading our 500 million European citizens. We are going to try that system for a second time. That's absolutely crucial, because when you look at things from the Council, once is an accident, twice is a rule. So let us make sure that we get it done twice. <laughs>